The following program is a UWTV classic. University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marsha Alvar. Historian Jeffrey Ward is inspired by the tension he finds between popular versions of history and history as it really happened. A Roosevelt scholar and award-winning biographer, Ward has also written extensively in film and television. For more than 10 years, he's collaborated with filmmaker Ken Burns, exploring such American subjects as Huey Long and the Statue of Liberty, and developing the scripts and companion books for series on the Civil War, baseball, and most recently, the West. Welcome to Upon Thanks. Reflection. Glad to be here. When you sit down with Ken Burns, or in the case of the West, Stephen Ives, with these huge subjects, a war, a national pastime, mm -hmm. the settling of a country, how do you begin piecing those into television? Well, you take a deep breath first. <laughs> and then uh, I believe history is biography. I, anything that isn't biography bores me as somebody who writes history and reads history. And I figure if I'm bored, other people will be. So we try to find some people that will tell the story that we're, that we're out to tell. And it's f the first job is really a selection of stories of who, who gives us the broadest, richest picture of whatever it is we want to do. And in fact, one of the descriptions of the West is that it's a story of stories. It is a story of stories. So absolutely. where do you find the stories? How, what's the detective work that's involved in finding the loves or the, the other characters of the West? Well, uh, they come from all sorts of places. Uh, we, we work very closely with good historians who sometimes suggest them. We find them in books. Uh, we find them in libraries and archives and so on. The loves, whom you mentioned, who are the wonderful couple at the end of, of the series and that are in the book, uh, actually were first written up by John McPhee uh, in, a, in a book in a different way. But we got fascinated by the sort of ancestors of the people that he was talking about. The, the work that you did on the West really brings you, in a sense, full circle to what you once described as your first great historical obsession. And that was a, an obsession you developed watching movies about the West as Absolutely. a boy. Absolutely. I was a, uh, you know, a know-it-all, a horrible <laughs> little know-it-all who knew sort of lore about things. And I used to, there's a sort of steady muttering when I went to the movies with my friends when I'd explain that that couldn't possibly be true and this happened before that and that's the wrong kind of gun and so on. <laughs> and in fact, the, the, the sort of cowboy and gunfighter stuff was mostly left out of the series in favor of things less familiar. But the great thing about doing these uh, companion volumes is I get the last word. Stuff which ended up on the cutting room floor, I get to jam back in. Into and the so book. there's a gallery of gunmen in here because I couldn't resist doing it. And One of the things you said about those Hollywood movies that you watched as a boy were that it was, it was the West as you and your friends wanted it to be. It was everything you wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the unlearning you must have had to do when you discovered that Hollywood was, was that, it was Hollywood. Well, I'm old enough to have gone through sort of two stages with this. Uh, when I was a kid, I was taught both the sort of gun, gunfighter cowboy legend, but also I was taught that the history of the West was blue-eyed pioneers and a conquering savage Indians. Uh, and then in the 60s, there began to be this other history in, in which uh, people sort of discovered Indians and turned them into another kind of non-human, it seems to me, a sort of uh, totally noble... Uh, sort of godlike of, status. Yeah, they sort of speak like Sierra Club sloganeers and, uh, and aren't really human beings. We hoped with this, and we worked very hard, to try to make everybody human, <laughs> which seems a simple-minded goal, but I don't think it happens terribly often in popular history, and it's, I think it's what we all should be working at. Um, and Scott Mamaday, who's a wonderful mm. 
a wonderful contributor to this series and, and voice for it, said that even though he's spent much of his life in the West, even though he's written a great deal about the West, that in the process of working on this series, there were things that he learned. And I thought, you must have been in very much the same kind of situation, really steeped in the history of well, it. I'm sure but I learned much more than Scott did. <laughs> what were the things you learned in the process uh, of Well, I, it's funny. You know things intellectually. Uh, but it, uh, I think the most imp if there's anything really fresh in here for, for popular history, not that this is a radical discovery. It's the presence of, of Hispanic Americans. Again, when I was taught history, Hispanic Americans sort of were an inconvenience and they magically disappeared uh, as soon as the gold rush and the Mexican War happened. Uh, once that was over, they were the sort of the source of picturesque names, but otherwise uh, they vanished. Well, of course, they didn't vanish. <laughs> and uh, I, I hope we made that clear in the series. And it was fun to try to bring, it was very hard because the, the, the record, the, the, both the pictorial and the written record, is not very rich. It's not as rich as some. But I think we managed to keep the th that thread alive through the mm. whole show. We certainly worked hard to do that. One aspect of that, for me as a viewer, was that it, sort of the classic version of the West is it's going from East to West, mm -hmm. when really the West, it was a convergence from every direction Absolutely. and around the world. Absolutely. It really was. It's named the West only because the last people who got there decided to call it the West. Hmm. But it was, it was the North for Mexicans. It was the South for people coming down from Canada and so on. The Chinese thought of it as, as an Eastern journey. So it's a, you know, it's a sort of ethnocentric name for hmm. it. We're going to take a look at just a couple of very short excerpts uh, from the West. And the first one uh, had to do with something that I learned, again, a great deal about watching this series, and that is the role of, of really the plain states, those Midwestern states, in black aspirations about this country and in the, in the Civil War mm -hmm. itself. Well, the Civil War was fought over the West. It was fought in the East, for the most part. But, but it, was, it was whether the West would be slave or free, which, which finally broke the country in two. Mm. And after the Civil War and when Reconstruction ended um, and white rule was imposed in the South, uh, a, a considerable number, thousands, of free black people chose to come uh, West onto the Kansas Plains looking for a new life. And mm. I think that must be what this clip talks about. They, were, they called themselves the Exodusters. The Exodusters. And this yeah. clip that we're looking at, this comes from the year 1877, mm -hmm. and it's about free ground. We'll right. take a look at that now from the series, The West. When I landed on the soil of Kansas, I looked on the ground and I says, this is free ground. Then I looked on the heavens and I says, them is free and beautiful heavens. Then I looked within my heart, and I said to myself, I wonder why I was never free before. I said, let us hold a little prayer meeting on the riverbank. It was raining, but the drops fell from heaven on a free family, and the meeting was just as good as sunshine. We were thankful to God, and we prayed for those who could not come. I asked my wife, did she know the ground she stands on? She said, no. I said, it is free ground. And she cried for joy. An excerpt from the West. And, and I really, I love that. I mean, it's from 1877. Uh, Reconstruction has collapsed. Uh, the hope that black Americans had for living in the South were, were dashed for the time. And like every other American, it was this great aspiration and hope that was found in the West. Well, I think that's, uh, that's um, an important message of this show. And one of the other things, again, to go back to Hispanic American story, those people came north for exactly the same reason this man went west. Uh, I mean, it, it is a place that has, it's a sort of endless repository of, of hope. One of the other things that I learned from the series, besides the, the wonderful power of film to to put you in the shoes of the people who are, who are being either discussed or portrayed was the speed with which some things happened. In the gold rush, for example, mm -hmm. the idea that 
because this fellow who was going to open a store near where gold was found had gone to San Francisco and marched through the streets and told people that gold was there, 75 percent of the men and boys in San Francisco were gone within yeah, a certain period of time. These enormous, very yeah, fast movements. It was hugely movements. fast. Uh, I, I think it was. I think I'm right on this. Jefferson said that the whole it would take a uh, hundred generations to people the West. It took five. I mean, Americans do things very quickly, and it's uh, you know it's both a, a source of pain because in doing things so fast, lots of terrible things happen, but it's also an amazing accomplishment. Why was it so fast? Was it just gold? Was it just these no, I think happenstances? I think it was, you know, opportunities and a place to go and a new place to start over and, and you, you have a chance to, you don't very often get a chance to sort of reinvent yourself. Mm. And the West allowed you to do that. The clip that we're going to look at now uh, is, a, is a quote from Mark Twain and I think it really captures this hustle and bustle and great uh, sort of stirring up that was always going on in the West with all the different parties involved. And we'll take a look at that. Now a little clip of Mark Twain from the West. Dear Mother, Our city lies in the midst of a desert of the purest, most unadulterated and uncompromising sand, in which infernal soil nothing but the fag end of vegetable creation, sagebrush, is mean enough to grow. Nevada territory is fabulously rich in gold, silver, lead, coal, iron, quicksilver, thieves, murderers, desperados, lawyers, Christians, Indians, Chinamen, Spaniards, gamblers, sharpers, coyotes, poets, preachers, and jackass rabbits. There is something very American about it. Even the way he rattles off all of those. Oh, uh, he's fabulous. He's fabulous. In fact, one of, the, one of the nice things about writing these shows is I get a lot of credit for writing. But oh, I get to use all these people's voices. I mean, when you can use Mark Twain as just one of your uh, voices, you're in pretty good shape. Why is so much of what we accept as the real thing in history wrong? Goodness. Uh, <laughs> well, I just think people want to believe the best possible about their ancestors and about themselves. And I think painful things you don't want to reexamine. Um, uh, I think the best example of it uh, is in the film and, and also in the book is Buffalo Bill, who, who as Richard White uh, points University out. University of Washington historian. Yes. And, and, and great guy. <laughs> and great guy and friend of popular history and, and serious historian. Uh, but he, he, at one point he says that Buffalo Bill's show, Wild West show, was deeply weird. And it was deeply weird because it's a version of, of, of Western history in which uh, Indians, uh, the, uh, pioneers creep across the continent while Indians attack them and somehow at the end of it all they end up with the whole continent without ever having committed a single uh, crime. The, the, uh, the, it the way he like said that. it was that that what Buffalo Bill did was manage to put together a show where the conquerors were the victims. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Now on one level I suppose every people does that but there's something about seeing it so blatantly in Buffalo Bill uh, that's amazing. The other thing about Buffalo Bill for me and why I, I'm so fascinated by him is that my grandmother sat on his lap uh, when I was raised on that story. And he tells you, he, he shows what a young country this is. Um, his, Bill, Buffalo Bill's grandfather fought in the revolution. My grandmother sat on his lap and I knew my grandmother very well and that's all of United States history. There are moments, as you <laughs> said, where you're literally touched by how recent this is. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the story that N. Scott Mamaday tells at the end of the West in the very last installment where he tells the story of a young man who rode with Chief Joseph who would spend summers with him and he said I met him of course he was a very old man but you realize yeah. that there that's almost like you Absolutely. feel the touch physically Absolutely. from the past. Yeah it's very recent Western history. American history is very recent. When you create you know, your own popular versions of mm -hmm. history in sure. doing these series. There are an awful lot of people who are involved. Mm -hmm. You have the filmmakers, the picture people. You have the historians, the print people. Do there come times when those two aspects of creating something 
come in conflict. I'm sure there must be. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Many. Give me an example of, of what a conflict would be and how you mediated your way through that. Because that, again, it's at the essence of all these versions of history that we get. Oh, it's, that's the great, it's both the most difficult part and the most challenging part of doing this, I think. Um, and the NEH, which funds a great many of these, these things, the National Endowment for the Humanities, requires that filmmakers, to get to use their money, use, employ historians in a serious way and listen to what they have to say. There's been terrible suspicion that's grown up over the years, perfectly understandably, between academic historians and filmmakers who have abused the privilege in the past. Uh, Ken works very hard with his historians to try to work out um, compromises where you have to compromise. It's, it's often, uh, it's very hard for s some historians to understand that there are only certain things you can do on screen, that it's not a lecture, and that there is the sort of perpetual thumb hanging over the, <laughs> over the channel switcher, uh, which is not present in the lecture room, and you've got to keep people interested and therefore some kind of compromises have to be made. And what about on the filmmaker's side? What the do filmmaker, you have to tell oh, them? <laughs> sure, it's very easy. Well, I'm in a funny position because I've written, a lot of, I've written a lot of written history also. So I'm sort of in between, and I try to keep everybody uh, uh, working together. And when you get people as good as Richard White, it's, it's not difficult because mm -hmm. he wants to help you. Mm -hmm. There are some things you never agree on. Um, uh, you can't have a blank screen in, in television, obviously. You can't have a, a screen in it which says there is no known portrait of this person or the camera wasn't invented <laughs> when this happened. So you've got to put something up there. And for some historians, they, they simply can't get beyond that. If that isn't, if, if the, if the uh, fuzzily photographed man from a great distance isn't really Chief Joseph, then you can't use it at all. Well, sometimes you've got to have, you've got to do some of that. Mm. History is is compromise, I guess. History is compromise. You spent, I, I understand, your high school years living outside of this country, living I did, in, in India, India. Mm -hmm. and wondered if that gave you any particular perspective on it. Something that that I kept asking myself the whole time I was watching the West, and that is, have we as Americans reinvented our history to any greater degree than people in other parts of the world? No, I think that's, that's a good question. And I know, I think we're, in fact, I think we have, uh, we're more willing to be tough on our history than lots of people in the world. Uh, uh, we, we flagellate ourselves, <laughs> I think, uh, more than most people do. Hmm. And, I, I, we, you know, we have our myths and so on, but I, I think there's almost an industry into looking into the worst aspects of our, of our history. And, and trying to produce a balanced picture, which is unflinching about that, but also has room for genuine heroism and achievement, is uh, fun to try. So why do we flagellate more than other people? That's a hard one. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I have an answer for that. Hmm. Well, I, one of the reasons that maybe we, we keep chewing around this whole business of our past is, number one, as you said, it's so very recent and, uh, and new. And... And maybe the other is that there are now so many more sources of information. I mean, as we go along in the information age and technology, it's, there are a zillion ways to find out things where before maybe you just went to see a Hopalong Cassidy movie or mm -hmm. something like that. It made me wonder, with the Internet and all of this stuff, how it would impact history and whether or not the history that's being made now, written now, transmitted now, because of all this information, is going to be any more accurate or less accurate? Yeah, it's very tough. You know, I, I was talking to someone recently about that. On the one hand, the people in this period who didn't have the internet and they didn't have email and they didn't have all the <laughs> things that I guess we're going to write history from, God help I us. how that would have changed things. But they knew how to write and they worked at expressing how they felt in a way that people don't now. And there are no letters between people like the, like the loves. I mean, the story that in there is told largely through letters. Well, people don't write letters like that. And I think in some ways, our picture of people now may actually be more limited rather than less because you don't get into the sort of internal thinking of people. I mean, email is not a substitute for, for real 
um, correspondence. It's hard to know. One of the other things that's happened in terms of the way history is portrayed in recent years has been the emergence of these sort of mutants, uh, docudramas, and, uh, and all this mm. kind of thing. How has that, in your view, changed the way people uh, trust information, trust history? Is the, is the ground getting shiftier? Yeah, I think the ground is getting... I mean, I, I, I basically loathe docudramas, <laughs> and I especially loathe Oliver, just, Oliver Stone's docudramas because they purport to be history, and they're not history. They're some other thing. Um, I, I'm just not very... It's not a form I like. It, it, you never know where you are. Whereas with, with, uh, with documentary, you really are trying to recreate to the best of your ability what really happened but you're not claiming to know things you can't know. And I think that's what docudrama does. Docudrama allows you to invent motives and dialogue and reasons that people did things, which may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. and but you're, but it, you wrote in an essay once that you think that the bravest kind of history is, is psychobiography. I mean, it's a term that's gotten to a kind of strange meaning attached to it. But this whole business of what made, for example, Franklin Delano Roosevelt do what he did as opposed to just what he did is what really gives us a sense of our history. Well, I did three volumes of that. That's true. Um, it's a, that's a tough one. I, I, I think it, psychobiography has gotten a bad name because I think people produce a sort of template if, you know, if you behave this way, then you're going to, you're, if, you were, if this was done to you when you were a child, you will do this. Therefore, you make people fit into that. I think that's terrible. I do think, though, that the kind of simple psychological thinking that one does when you, for instance, are in college and you meet the parents of your classmates, and you do have those moments when you say, aha, I know why she acts that way or he acts that way. And you're probably not wrong about that. I think you can do that with historical figures. And Franklin Roosevelt, I had the great advantage of his mother who kept every scrap of paper from his childhood. So it was uh, a very long way from email. Hmm. I mean, a little while ago I asked you about why so much of what we know about history is wrong. And, and maybe, maybe it's not that it's right or it's wrong, but it's, it's, it's as somebody once said, the devil is in the details. Yeah, well, I, I think... I was thinking, for example, in talking about your Roosevelt biographies, everyone knows Franklin Delano Roosevelt had polio. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. What we didn't know until you wrote your books is the day-to-day -day struggle that that meant for him and how much of his life, his time, and his energy were taken up with coping with that. So that's not so much psychobiography, it's just well, what's that, the real gritty day-to-day -day stuff? In that case, it has to do with a certain amount of empathy, because I had polio when I was a kid. So those details and the particular humiliations that he had to fight were pretty uh, close to me. And mm. so it was, interesting to, it was interesting to write about. I'm still thinking about that, and I may write some more about it, because <laughs> it's, it's an interesting subject. <laughs> Is America the only palette of history you're ever going to need? Uh, I think there's plenty of room to write about America and, and not be bored. I, I did write a book about Indian tigers, which has absolutely was nothing your first to do with book. this. Wasn't well, it? Was uh, your I know first? I wrote another one about India, but yeah, but we, my wife and I did a book on, on tigers a couple of years ago, which is a, my sort of hobby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but in, in historical terms, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to work here. Hmm. T.H. Watkins uh, in the West said a I guess what I consider to be the real dilemma of coming to grips with the pendulum swings of history uh, that we've gone through with the West. And it, why don't you, s you know what I'm, what I'm going to, what I'm going to say. Well, we, you sum him up and then I'll talk. I'll, yeah. Okay. What he said was these two great aspects of our history. He said, the hope that's symbolized by the mythology of the West, if we lose that hope, we really lose a part of ourselves, a best part of ourselves. On the other hand, the settlement of the West was a systematic violation of, of our best ideals and our best principles. So you have in the West the love family, a wonderful you know, story of, of hope, and, and then you have great horror and great, and great tragedy. And is there 
a kind of reconciliation that can come out of that, or do they just simply have to exist I side think, by side? I think they coexist. I think I think that's what it is. We we said in the preface to the book and and implied at least in the film that there's there's all kinds of things that one can only feel really shame over in the history of the West. On the other hand, I, there are also things. I think anybody can take pride in things that happened in the West, even if that pride is merely to have resisted encroachment by other people. I mean, it's it's a huge canvas full mm. of. Uh, full of fascinating people. Hmm. And when you're done with one of these huge projects that consumes you for, for years on end, how do you move on to something different? Well, Ken, uh, I, Ken and I, I think, share a sort of infinite enthusiasm for the subject, and we hurt, sort of hurl ourselves into the next one. <laughs> the next one is jazz, which, uh, which I'm, I've already written the first drafts of the first scripts for, and which will be on in the year 2000. And we'll, and we'll also have a book, and it's a joy. It's, it's something I've, I've been collecting jazz records since I was 10. And to be paid for that, I should not say this on television, but <laughs> to be paid for that is almost obscene. Ah, oh, well, what a, wonderful, uh, what a wonderful way to make a living. <laughs> it is, it's just terrific. Knock on. Knock on wood, may it always yeah. continue. Why don't you make your own film? I mean, you have, uh, you have such a background in the visual arts, you study the visual arts. Why not just make your own movie? Uh, well, uh, that's nice of you to ask. I'm not sure I could, and I have been extremely lucky. I've never had to be in the horrible world of fundraising, Ooh. which is the trick, which is the really hard part of this. The rest of it's easy, but raising the money is hell, and uh, I, I've so far not had to get involved in it. That makes that sounds like it'd make a wonderful subject for a film <laughs> by Ken Burns with the uh, the script and the book by Jeffrey Ward, raising money, <laughs> raising <in the> money <laughs> <right>. <laughs> to do your work. <laughs> Jeffrey Ward, I want to thank you so much, and I really me. highly recommend viewing the West and uh, and reading the book to anybody. Come back again after you do jazz. Well, I'll be here. Okay. Thanks. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org/classics.